fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro. David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Los Angeles. One hundred two point three FM Riverside. And one hundred five oh AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. John Copenhaver's here. Hey, Al. How you doing? I am delicious. Oh, finger sounds... licking good. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So listen, uh, we are talking with an author today. She's going to be at Left Coast Crime Two with us all in Seattle. So it's going to be a lot. Of, there seems to be a lot of people going there this year. It's going to be a good event. It's going to be fun. Yeah. So now the book we're talking about is called Blessed Water, um, a sister holiday mystery. And it's uh, Sister Holiday Mystery Book Two. We've got the uh, author with us, uh, Margot Duwahi. Thank you for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me, Al and John. Margot, the type of books you're writing, mm-hmm. do you do you ever get any kind of a negative response oh, from people? Oh, yes, indeed, Al. I certainly do, and I have to say, I that's not the intention of my art. You know, is to, I guess, pro- provocation in one way, um, but. Like religion itself, I think it's very personal, and everyone has a unique pathway into it and a relationship with it, art, storytelling, religion, organizing principles, etc. And I do get quite a lot of pushback uh, from folks that would, you know, take this. <laughs> this is, my novels are not autobiographies. Um, they, I am not a nun. I do have some tattoos, but I am not tatted up or don't have a gold tooth like Sister Holiday. And Sister Holiday is, is an iconoclastic nun. She's not somebody that you would expect to take provisional vows of obedience, chastity, and poverty um, with the Sisters of the Sublime Blood. But yeah, some folks that I think I'll uh, hold specific ideas about what these religious representations mean to them and they guard them and police them to the point where they think they own them and even an artist like myself shouldn't be able to play in that playground and I take that as in some ways I don't know a representation of a lack of confidence in the thing that you're trying to quote unquote protect you know we we can't police one another's thoughts and so I think What people have inside, they push out. So in the case of getting nasty emails, there's perhaps something unformulated or nasty inside that's just coming out. And maybe, as John, as you mentioned, somebody has something they're not able to express in another kind of way or forum. They're going to punch wherever they can. And sometimes that's behind the safety of a screen or anonymously. But more than that, I've received so many notes, letters even, sent to my agent from folks who felt like, my books are helping them navigate some Catholic trauma and religious trauma, the ability to see themselves back inside of a Catholic church, looking at the stained glass. And uh, yeah, even in the feminist book club review, the author pointed out, you know, the ways (laughs) the reading of mystery didn't expect to kind of address her feelings of otherness and trauma and in a religious space, but it's just an extra extra bonus of what I think mysteries can offer to us. Well, what drew you to this? What, what, what took you down this path, do you think? And sorry if it's redundant for John, because we've chatted about it before, but I'm a huge fan of the hard-boiled school, the voice of the swaggering, wisecracking, lone wolf sleuth that is a bit obsessed in their own mind. And sometimes they're even their first-person narration Uh, Their obsessions, their dog with a bone attitude causes them to miss things and their partialities and their occlusions even get in their own way. I like a flawed character like that. I am not a person who wants to write a a very methodical police procedural in which every single, you know, detail is covered with forensic uh, scrutiny. I'm much more of the passionate kind of emotional, hyperbolic, intense sort of 
Sleuth, that's what I like. I love that about Raymond Chandler. Uh, Philip Marlowe is certainly a smart guy, but I like his attitude. I like Chester Himes, you know, Rage in Harlem. I love, I love these guys that get really messy. I like a mess, <laughs> but then a mystery. So I've always been a huge fan. And then the neo hard boils of the 80s and 90s, Sue Grafton, J.M. Redman, um, Sarah Paretsky, the Bringing Feminist, and queer, libera- queer liberation into their hard-boiled stories. So I've just always loved that type of voice for the mystery. And then as I was thinking about making my own series, I thought, okay, I want that voice. I want a weirdo lone wolf, but I also I want a different kind of insider-outsider. So I went with the nun figure. Drawing on some of my own experience, going to Catholic school in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where my teachers were nuns, and try to make my own way with the lineage and really honor the lineage that I care about, but also subvert it. Right. Well, so how do you get into the character, you know, your main character here? How do you, um, let's say, how do you experience that character? Do you hear, see her? Is it like a movie? Um, Do you classify her as a sister or daughter or friend or... Mm -hmm. Kind of what's your experience with your main character? It's a great question. I do try to see the world as she would see it, which is really different than me, because I'm actually, even though I was raised in the Catholic Church, I'm no longer an active participant of it. So to channel her interior mind, I was constantly trying to think of how would she thread the needle with, she's super devout, she believes in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, she reads the Bible, and yet she's, you know, pretty foul-mouthed, uh, kind of a nihilistic person in some ways, but with a strange kind of, strange hope that lives within it. So I had to kind of ask, what would Sister Holiday think of this moment? That Would she find some resonance with this that relates to her, you know, constantly stepping outside of myself and giving her a sensibility? giving her a particular attitude. I love tone and tonality in, in storytelling, whether it's books or movies. And you have that like, really strong point of view. She has that. And so I constantly give her lots of tests. I throw lots of rocks at her and throw her into lots of fire and lots of water and see what she does. <laughs> it's a bit um, masochistic, honestly. And, and so, but when you put your character through that, it sounds like quite the uh, turmoil here. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you deal with it? Like, how does it change you when you, let's say, you spend a year with your main character and, and, and she's going through all of these things and attacking things in a certain way that you might not yourself, but you still kind of live the experience, you know, in order to make it real? Um, so how, how does that change you? It repaired my rift with my own religion, you know, that I grew up with. I used to get a lot of panic attacks when I would have to go to uh, church again for various reasons. My family is extremely religious. And so writing these books actually gave me a new access point where I could be in these spaces that I felt very much othered in and by. But now when I'm there, I sort of see the world through Sister Holiday's eyes. And, you know, the theatricality and the high camp of it is one thing, but then also, you know, like, the statue of like uh, Sister Lucy with the plate with eyes and there's so much intensity and it can even be a bit uh, gory or even horrific, you know, the the different iconographies, but seeing it through her eyes, going into the like, oh, okay, how can I turn this into a mystery? It's just been hugely comforting and repairing for me. Um, And I have a lot more empathy. I have a lot more empathy for people who find so much comfort in religion and whether or a place in life so maybe that's being part of a church or a temple or a synagogue or even just being a a daughter of a family or a sister or a mom or dad or a husband or wife or just a good neighbor good friend you know so i have a lot more empathy now and a lot less i don't know i don't know yeah sister holiday just really she's helped helped me heal right and so in and how how do you deal with the church and their ways and having a character that is so um, provocative then? How do you, how do you kind of make it work? I guess that's kind of a weird thing to say, but how do you make it so that she exists in that, that world? Yeah. And cause 
otherwise, if if it didn't feel authentic, it would just feel like, oh, it's, um, you know, actually, <laughs> I'm trying to remember, I don't usually read reviews unless they're sent to me. Um, John and I were just chatting about that, reading reviews. Yeah, but yeah. I, someone did send me a review of Blessed Water that's in the Christian century, and I just thought, oh, God, here we go. <laughs> here we go. Race <laughs> for impact. But it was the most beautiful review, and uh, so I'll just sort of borrow some of that language. It was basically saying, because the character is so authentic to herself and her kind of extremes, what some people would consider opposites or, you know, duality, or dialectic, it's like the yes and. It's like, yes, she's a hot-tempered anger management, <laughs> needs to go to anger management class. Um, she has a bad, you know, she doesn't trust a lot of people, but yet she and she's a punk musician, and she is a devout Catholic sister in a convent. <laughs> it's These things are very, very real to her. It's not a masquerade like you would see in Sister Act, which is a classic of American cinema. <laughs> <laughs> genuinely faithful. And so for me, that is how I can write a queer, you know, a lesbian identified uh, 34-year-old, you know, blessed starts in Scorched Grace, she's 33, Blessed Water, she's 34, that she's on a journey of her understanding of her place in the world and keeping it authentic and not trivializing or running into caricature, even though I like high style, uh, it was really important to keep this sleuth believable, real, contoured, flawed, so that she feels real enough that you would want to follow her through these wild mysteries of fire and, and water. And she's, you know, I had to read reread a lot of the Bible, actually, to create her inner life and her inner interiority. So I'm constantly, like, splicing <laughs> lyrics of Bikini Kill and X-ray specs and punk and post punk <laughs> with... Mark and Matthew and Genesis. It's like, it's a real, it, it was really interesting to, to create this character that could feel real, uh, e you know, even though they're, it's a big leap for me in a lot of ways, but I, she feels very real to me. Subtext. Is there a meaning under, underneath all this ex, exciting story and all this stuff that's going on? Or is it just purely entertainment? I love subtext. Sometimes I'm more into the subtext than the text. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm a kind of like a B-side type of gal. Um, <laughs> you know, show me the B-side gems and I'm in for life. I think the subtext here, Al, is that, you know, everybody has a journey that's, it might seem completely bananas to other people. And even the idea of a mystery itself on its face is this constructed thing. It's artifice, okay, body in the library or whatever. But, we, you know, the mysteries of life are something we encounter every single day. Like, the mortal coil, like, what does it all mean? You know, love, you know, you take a vow of marriage or something, you're like, to death to us part, like, really? What? You know, I think the, uh, modern life is full of these huge mysteries. And so there's that the text, the primary mystery, but then there's just so many subtextual mysteries that I, I try to really let kind of push and, and pull and create a lot of texture in the books. You know, I, when I was reading Scorch Grace, I kept on thinking about, um, you know, and not to get too philosophical, Christian existentialism. And I think this character, I mean, this idea of a sort of fallen or flawed or you know, complex character trying to maintain their faith and that it's very important to them. I mean, it certainly feels very fresh for crime fiction. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I can't think of anything else in crime fiction. And maybe you can correct me that's, you know, really after the same kind of thing. Um, but it's really what, in terms of like subtext, I'm just curious, like, um, when you started, you know, set out to create this character in this, in the story, you know, did you realize this is what you were after, or was it more of an exploratory process? That's a great question, and I love experimentation. I, to me, it's everything. Like, <laughs> and sometimes I have a hard time with it. Just as a little tiny sidebar, I am so busy all the time. But I sometimes, like, I feel like we're our most authentic selves when we're spontaneous. You know, like 
a spontaneous thing or an encounter you didn't quite expect. It brings out almost this like childlike quality in us. And so I do make time to experiment. And I was writing poetry for 15 years and I was starting to, to write long form. I was writing in the absolute shadows. Like I was just kind of a nowhere, nobody type of person just like doing work in other, you know, I was doing a PhD program and all this. I was working at a yoga studio, I worked at a hair salon and all this stuff. But I wanted to write uh, start, you know, getting this foundation for what would be a hard-boiled, inspired series. So voice-driven, character-driven, more in that style. Um, but I did start with this idea of, okay, my lone wolf is going to be a nun. <laughs> and that's really where it started. All of the kind of subtext and even thinking about how even in the Bible itself, beyond, you know, Cain and Abel is a, is a crime story. You know, there's so much to think about retroactively applying what we love about crime fiction and mysteries to the, to these organizing institutions in our lives. Like, yeah, all the things. So, but it started with just this character and seeing like, okay, what would she notice? You know, like, of course we've got these tropes like Miss Marple people, you know, they don't think she's worth much because she's this like elderly lady, but she uses that against everybody. She's eavesdropping. She's getting the tea you know, a lot of sleuths have their unique investigative power. And I just thought, okay, if she's a young nun, what can she do in terms of putting a puzzle together or solving a mystery or solving a crime? And then, of course, I needed this this individual to be queer and to be steeped in the queer storytelling world. So her beloved brother, who people think they're twins because they're only 18 months apart, sort of like what the old school would call like the Irish twins and they're from Brooklyn you know her brother is gay as well she's the lesbian older sister he's the younger gay brother and she wants to kind of be a, like a carer for him and she fails sort of miserably and that's something she carries with her guilt so I try to explore family and all of this but it a lot of subtext in those ways but they all have to feel like cohesive with the sleuth character you know so yeah a long way to say it, it really just through the process of character it opened up a lot of plot points for me and then subtext so talk a little bit about your start with and i'm sure you're still writing poetry it's not like it's over <laughs> but i'm really curious and i have been for some time this connection between poetry and mystery fiction um but, you know there are a lot of poets who were big fans of mystery fiction. So I don't, I don't think I'm, I'm sort of making this up. Um, like Auden was, and he even wrote a, a, an essay about it, and T.S. Eliot, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Interesting, the modernists. Um, but like, what do you think's the connection? Like, wh what's, what's going on with that? <laughs> it's a huge overlap. And the more I've dug into it, the more delight I have found. And you're so right. Yeah, I love T.S. Eliot's work um, on detective the detective genre, I think there is a natural overlap because, you know, in some ways we puzzle through poems the same way we puzzle through a mystery. There's a lot of care. Every word itself in a sonnet, for example, is load bearing. Every word serves a kind of a purpose. And similarly, if you're writing kind of tensile mystery, it's like every word you can use words in the same way to mislead, to misdirect, a red herring. Or to, like, you know, thicken the mystery. So I think that actually, you know, and, and even when I think about Edgar Allan Poe, for example, he was writing poetry and his mysteries, whether the, like, that first person one, the telltale heart, or even some of the more complex ones, like um, the purloined letter, <laughs> which is just this, like, funny turn. But, um, you know, the murders in the Rue Morgue, like, all at the same time. And so I, I think there's a, just so much to learn from both of them. And I think there's a lot of clue work and, you know, deciphering that we can do in poetry. Like, hmm, how can I make a synthesis here? How can I make an interesting connection? So I think it's actually quite, they're really cool compliments and fun. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it's fascinating. In fact, even uh, I think Joseph Hansen, a, a sort of totally. uh, very famous gay uh, crime writer who folks should read if they haven't, 
uh, started off as a poet, um, and or at least led that led to the rhyme fiction. So it, there, it, there's many many examples. Um, now I know we're both teachers, so I'm going to ask a teacher question. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, what do you think could be learned? from uh, reading crime fiction in an English classroom? Like, why should we be teaching crime fiction? You know, it's often thought of as not, um, you know, high enough literature, quote unquote, for study, but um, I know you study it and teach it, and I do as well. I was curious what your thoughts were. Oh, I, I think it's something I will, <laughs> I will die on this hill. I think it's so unique as a form of storytelling and art that I think it ha well, A, it has enduring appeal. You know, there's a new hunger for mysteries with every, every new generation. You know, I'm Gen X, like Gen Omega, like everybody is always <laughs> evergreen. Everybody likes to engage with a mystery, I find. You know, it's not a scientific poll that I've done, but... I think bringing it into the classroom provides a forum for thinking about how how do we know what we know? You know, I think detective fiction is actually an epistemological form. It's like a study of knowledge. How does a sleuth really put it together for themselves versus another kind of sleuth? So it's like thinking about how people see through see the world. What is their particular lens? Through that, we can deeply explore power, powerlessness, Who's on the inside? Who's on the outside? Who has access? Um, you know, social justice issues and questions are just one of the many, you know, kind of cascade of benefits of thinking about detective fiction in the liter in a literary context. And also using craft. How do you deploy craft to write a ripper, like a real ripper that people feel is very rich, but also like you just want to tear through it. So you, you know, you build this kind of suspense that it feels almost physical. And you're like, oh my God, I need to know. <laughs> so you're using craft to make the stakes feel real, cross paint them. There's intimate stakes that are like softer or lighter than there's like bigger stakes, like literally loss of life. You know, we see that in your book, The Hall of Mirrors, starting with this idea of like watching fire and you know, the idea of like exterior and interiority at once. And detective fiction allows that to come into the like our full focus because we're looking at it like, okay, how is it crafted to be both withholding and revealing? How much does the author choose to kind of titrate? Like, okay, we're going to give a little bit here and then wait. So it's just, I think they're glorious craft case studies. Really? And then plot twists? Oh, my God. They're narratological. <laughs> you know, you get a plot twist, like Dennis Lehane's Shutter Island or the Decagon House Murders, or and then there was none. You know, there were none. Agatha Christie, like, how do you build a foundation to be completely flipped upside down? It's a beautiful craft exploration. I just think it's endlessly important to, to bring it into the curriculum. I have a uh, question about twists since you brought them up because I think about twists a lot. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I still haven't decided this. Um, and uh, I'm curious what you think. But in a, are, do we arrive at twists at, through kind of careful planning or do we arrive at twists through exploration? Um, and I feel like I have examples of both. So I don't know, maybe the answer's both. What do you think? I think both. I really do. Just like everything else, I think it's so unique, project to project. I'm, you know, I'm thinking of if you like the Alex Michaelides books, you know, Silent Patient or The Maidens or The Fury, which just came out. Um, I don't know about his process, but you know, they're almost like <laughs> they're the architecture is like to satisfy a need for twist. And you know, for me, I'm thinking about it. I always like to have kind of a either a double cross or a triple cross. <laughs> and I like I like it's almost like taking a stone and like skipping it, you know, seeing how many bounces and skips you'll get. But I think it's I think it has to come from an authentic place. So if that's structure, great. You gotta own it. You gotta double down. Or if it's more discovery, again, 
you got to own that and triple down because, you know, if it's like completely out of left field, you lose a reader. And you're like, no way that no, you know? So yeah, I think it's depending on where you're coming from, just own it and make sure it feels authentic. You know, I wonder when you, when you write about the church part of it, do you write it as a setting, as a character? Oh, definitely. Yes. I mean, the, the stained glass, as you can see, like, <laughs> I, I feel that they do, you know, the, the places that we're in, for better or for worse, reflect what we bring to them sometimes. And then the other side is true. Like, if there's a historic place that doesn't allow for much of your personal contribution, how do you make your little mark? Is it lighting a candle and the prayer candle near the sacristy or the incense or whatever it might be. So oh, very much, I think, I try to use it really as a leverage, it as a character. So some characters could walk into the church and they are freaked out and don't feel comfortable at all. And then others go in and have a sense of almost like entitlement or ownership. So just like New Orleans itself, where the books are set, I think each place has to kind of hum and ripple with its own thing. I like it when I'm reading Scandinavian noir and I feel like frostbite. <laughs> I love atmosphere. You know, I love the DC of your books, John. I love to be shown something in a new way that you think you already know. It's like super fun. Did you kind of, do you know how many books you're going to do with a series like this? Yeah. Do you kind of have that? Four. This is a quartet, a limited edition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but so you you kind of know where it's beginning and where it ends, and you're just kind of filling it in as you go, or do you have it all mapped out? I have the baseline mapped out. So I like we were talking about before. I like I need to be spontaneous, but I also need to know that you know if I'm going on a road trip, I need to know the car that I'm driving. <laughs> like there's certain things I need in order to be spontaneous and to bring my full self to it. So I do lay a baseline and I actually start with the end. So I then kind of have to discover, I just, it's like reverse big bang. I go backwards. I'm like, okay, I know, I know the feeling that I want at the end. And in Scorched Grace, it's like incineration and complete burning and rolling around in the ashes, literally. And scorched. And then, you know, with blessed water, it's like submerging, swallowing, um, drowning, you know, blood, bloodshed, tears, crying. So it's like I work backwards in that way, but I know for the four, there's a broader arc for Sister Holiday, for Revo, for Moose, for Prince Dempsey, the major characters, and then each book has a mini arc for everybody. But I like an ensemble cast, so I also try to know what they're all doing too. Do you hear all their voices in your head too? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And they each have to talk to each other, like Prince and Moose and Bernard and Sister Holiday. They each, it's almost like a parent has to talk to all their kids. Like, it's not just like, you know, mom and three kids. It's like, you know, mom and Jeff or mom and Al and mom and John. Like, you each have to have your own unique relationship with the other characters or else they're not fully developed enough, in my opinion. You gotta lock them, you know, lock them up together and see what they do individually, and then as a group, because I love that group. Maybe it's my like addiction to '80s or '90s thrillers and heists, but like I love a big group scene, and I love I love like an ensemble cast that really rips. Right, and who people are mm -hmm. when they're with certain other members are sometimes quite a bit different when they're not. Do you know? Definitely, absolutely. Yeah. And that's something to catch, you know. Um, well, do they, so they, they still let you have a driver's license when you hear all these voices in your head? <laughs> I am constantly surprised. Although I, <laughs> I'm now being in my 40s, though, I love to be carded. So I still am, like, always happy to whip out my driver's license and show people. Um, but, yeah, I know. I'm surprised that they let me do anything. <laughs> so how long does it take you to, to do each one of these books, roughly? Uh, a year about but i will say though they've been living in my head for more than 10 years sort of incubating and marinating so 
Well, and I've done a lot of work on kind of giving each character their character grid, and you know, each character has their own deep dark secret and care, you know, their own karaoke go to. Like I've done a lot of a lot of the the work that I think is what I love about a book. Like the, the you just feel like you have their residue all over you. Like you just met somebody at a bar. Like I love that feeling. I love feeling bereft after. Uh, reading because you're like losing somebody it's almost like something to grieve so yeah I, but it takes about a year and as a matter of fact i need to really start writing the next yeah, one work. <laughs> get to work <laughs> well so so what so what's going to happen to all of your your characters when when you're finished with the series where do they go oh my god al i can't even think about it it's too sad <laughs> it's too sad actually honestly i have been I haven't even thought about it, but I will say this one thing, little, little, you know, House of Mystery exclusive right here. Um, <laughs> this was going to be a trilogy, and then, but now it's a quartet. Part of the reason why is it was, you know, it was great, agreed upon by the publishing team and my wonderful publisher, Gillian Flynn, but more like, I just thought, wait a second, I'll never write another book in Sister Holiday's voice? Like, I'm not ready to keep, I'm not ready to lose her. I'm, I, I, it's too sad. It's too crazy. So I was like, okay, we'll do another book, another book. <laughs> so I got two more with her. And then, you know, but I, the arc is very clear in my head. So, you know, maybe I'll do an occasional flash fiction like Sister Holiday's Christmas, which is just like, a motorcycle bar fight and an orgy or something, but you know, like a little <laughs> flash fiction type of thing that honors the Black Mask magazine, the short forms. But yeah, four and done. I don't know. I'm. I'm. Yeah. I can't even. You're gonna be lonely. Gonna be sad. You know, they're all gone. They're gonna move out. They're packing up oh. and leaving. <laughs> They've had it. They want. They want. Ow, more. you're depressing me. <laughs> they they want more. They want more. You can't just end it like this. No. I think part of that. We have some time. We have a few years. They're going to John's house. They're, They're moving there. The... <laughs> okay. They're going to be terrible renters, John. Trust me. <laughs> Too many puppies. It's like better to read about them, not live with them, right? Exactly. <laughs> you can like. You can love them, but maybe not like them. Oh yes. Indeed. I think that's true for my own characters. I'm not so sure I'd want them. I, w I wouldn't want them to ha 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 be house guests. <laughs> yeah. Not in your house, anyway. Someone else's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I, I, love to hear, I love to hear the gossip. I just don't want to be the gossip. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay then. Well, this has been interesting and really appreciate you being on the show. Of course, we've been talking about the sister holiday mysteries and we've been talking about book two, Blessed Water. And uh, our guest is the uh, author of these, Margot Duwahi. Thank you for being here. No, Alan, so much. I'm a huge fan of the show and of John, and, and I truly appreciate this. It means a lot. It really does. I love our writing community. I feel like I've landed at home in the crime fiction community. So thank you so much for welcoming me, and I look forward to hanging out in Seattle at the Left Coast Crime. Yeah, it's going to be a blast. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.